for the 10th Americas RCE regional meeting this year. This is a reminder to try and stay on mute if you can. Um, at the bottom of your, we are, we are recording all this. And also at the bottom of your screen, you can find a, it looks like a little circle and it says inter interpretation and you are able to uh, click on a language of your choice. We have interpreters for uh, Hindi, um, what else, uh, Spanish um, and Italian here today to help Arabic. you Arabic. in Arabic, yeah. Um, and Brian's gonna go ahead and begin uh, introducing our first speaker. What well, did we want President White to go first? That's, that's who's gonna go first. Oh, and then, and then Brett, you want me to do both? Uh, oh. If okay. you wanna do President White first. Yeah, then. sure, sure. So uh, folks, uh, Charles White, the president of Salisbury University is a, a big fan of the United Nations and RCE University network and uh, this is his first introduction to the americas uh central south and north america there's 25 rces in here and uh, we have a great relationship with uh, the university it's been our longest partner uh, we came from the university and spun off about 22 years ago but we've always maintained uh, a very healthy good relationship and our rce is benefiting uh immensely from the relationship because we're a teaching hospital for undergraduate graduate students who work in our location and Chuck is uh, our newest president been here for a few years and in this short time we've made a lot of strides so uh, and he's by the way he's an energetic chemist which means he's from Caltech and energetic chemists they like to blow things up but he's a really gentle guy and you'll find out right now so uh, ladies and gentlemen President Chuck White. Thank you Brian. Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 10th RCE uh, 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 Center th for Education and Sustainable De Development uh, Americas uh, virtual meeting program. That's a mouthful. I'm Charles White, uh, president of Salisbury University. This year's theme is creating an ongoing America's learning space for sustainable development. And I'm especially honored to provide a few remarks this year because it is so important that those of us who have roles in education embrace our responsibility on this front. I wanna thank SU's, only doc, uh, uh, SU's own Dr. Brittany Spout, Fouts, the director of RCE Salisbury, and also yeah, thank everyone who helped to organize this event for putting on a, a focus on a more sustainable future. Uh, university relationships with RCEs gives our institutions, as well as the students and the communities we serve, experiential learning opportunities for students of all ages. In most cases, these experiences would not otherwise be available to them. Healthy partnerships in these areas are critical, not only to our students' education, but to creating a more holistic learning experience that is so desperately needed in a global society. For example, RCE Salisbury is engaged in local sustainability development projects related to climate action, food security and peace and just institutions. We've also made it part of our teaching hospital method and mission to actively collaborate with RCE locations worldwide. We're working on a number of interesting projects on issues such as environmental tourism in India, COVID vaccination diplomacy in Nepal, youth networking in Mexico, uh, cross-border water cooperation efforts with uh, Jordan, Palestine, and Israel, and many other real-world and exciting activities that help move the dial ever closer to a more peaceful, just, and balanced world. RCE Salisbury works with other parts of our university and other partners in the community, such as the city of Salisbury, on local issues, such as criminal justice reform task force, or with the Maryland governor's office on the Oyster Advisory Commission and maintaining the health and productivity of the Chesapeake Bay. We are proud partners and supporters, supporters of the RCE mission. And I wish you a successful and engaging conference. Thank you. Thank you, President White. Okay, Brittany, should I go, go on to Brett? Appreciate yeah. those. The, energetic opening. So I, I want to introduce to you uh, the second speaker. He's our guest of honor 
it's Brett Lee Shelton, who happens to be a senior attorney uh, who specializes in Native American rights. And Brett is with the uh, Native American Legal Rights or Legal Fund, and it's in Boulder, Colorado. But uh, he's a member of the Ogala Sioux um, tribe, and he's with the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, which is in southwest South Dakota, not too far from Mount Rushmore and uh, the Black Hills. And Brett and I met a few years ago because um, for like 30 years I've been working with tribal nations all over the United States. And Brett is, there's two things Brett's doing tonight. He's having us appreciate any that the fact that all the way in South America, the Mapuche Indians, all the way down the bottom of Chile, all the way up to where Polly and her, her gang live in Alaska, there are indigenous communities, thousands of them that are doing wonderful things along the same lines of what we're doing in our RCE, America's Network on Sustainable Development Goals. The other thing that Brett's doing is, even though he's an attorney and he works on specific legal issues for Indian rights and sacred spaces and things like that, he's also their lead on alternative dispute resolution, indigenous conflict resolution and problem solving. And there's a lot to be learned. And a few years ago, we were doing some work out West and it was very clear to me that uh, Brett's, first of all, he's cut from very special cloth. He's a super nice guy. He's somebody you want, you want to get old with and be your neighbor, but he really knows what he's talking about on the conflict resolution side of the fence and on the legal dispute settlement side. And he knows um, what he prefers. And you're going to find out real quickly just based on his character, what he's doing. So he's, he's going to talk about his work in the, in, in the Americas with indigenous populations and especially with um, the networks that we can form with his friends when it comes to SGD work. So with that, Brett, the floor is yours. And you just tell us when you want us to click on uh, the film and stuff like that, okay? Okay, thanks, Brian. That's a, a generous introduction. I sure appreciate it. And I appreciate this opportunity to speak in front of everybody and, and appreciate your attention. Actually, to get things rolling, um, I thought we could go ahead and look at this video that we produced for the Indigenous Peacemaking Initiative, which is the project that we're talking about. And I'll explain a lot about that in the, in the video. But you'll, and more importantly, you'll hear from some of the peacemakers from the different tribal nations who serve as advisors to me in this work. And they're from around the United States, different nations. So Brittany Fouts is going to run that from, from Salisbury. And then I'll talk some more after that's over. Starting point for me was a 13 year old girl that appears in court for truancy. And the judge calling her case, the young lady approaches the bench, reads the charge, asks her how she pleads, and she says, guilty. The judge simply says, okay, I'll find you guilty. I'm imposing a fine of $90. You have 90 days to pay that fine. If you do not pay that fine in 90 days, your driver's license will be suspended when you're eligible to get one. That took around 11 seconds. When she came to get her paperwork, I said, young lady, why don't you go to school? She was a young native girl, maybe 13. And she said, Every morning when I wake up, my mother is with a different man. And my friends tease me. That's when I saw that system did not work at all. It took a young girl that was seeking help from a system that's supposed to protect her, and it punished her. The legal system that we deal with in the United States and, and where, wherever else we have common origins in the legal system is an adversarial system. So the whole goal is basically to put up the best fight. Whoever puts up the most convincing fight wins. Well, neither side really wins a lot of the time because both sides walk away with bruises, right? And, and if you imagine that, that the two sides were just individuals trying to work it out, it's kind of like might makes, makes right or whoever wins the fight wins, wins right? Um, the problem's not necessarily solved at all in that case. And so you got to question the roots of the doctrine, right? 
and within tribal communities, and I'd say that you know everybody comes from a tribal tradition, they may have forgotten it, um, but everybody's indigenous to somewhere in their roots. And those people learned how to live together over long periods of time without ha harming each other uh, irreparably, without walking around with grudges all the time. And so if we look to cultures that are still uh, reflective of, of their origins of indigenous cultures, then I think we're going to see a better way of doing things a lot of times. The Native American Rights Fund is the nation's uh, oldest and largest nonprofit law firm uh, devoted to protecting and advancing Indian rights. And so they've been working since the early 1970s to protect all sorts of Indian rights. Now, one of their projects has been the Indigenous Peacemaking Initiative, which started about 1992 at NARF. And since that time, they've been trying to keep their hands in supporting tribal efforts to revive native dispute resolution processes, typically called peacemaking. The peacemaking process is about identifying issues, problem solving, and developing common sense consensus solutions that work for people in the community. Community harmony may be at stake beyond individual wellness and healing for individuals and supporting and encouraging people to realize the fullest of their potential and to live their life in a good way. Philosophically for us Anishinaabe people in Michigan and the Great Lakes area, we call it uh, Mano Benatsawin, and really it means living your life in a good way. When we, when we do restorative, we use our traditional values, and one of those being love. So in a, in a um, system, systems, court systems, those kind of systems, there is no love, and that's, that's a lot of it. But traditional values are, are what we want to teach our children, our um, people that uh, missed out on hearing those because of our effects of uh, boarding school era that weren't given our traditional values, our stories, our teachings, those kind of things. And today I think um, when we talk about cultural identity, that's who we are, are those values. That's what we learn throughout our life. In, in cake, they all know each other. So they all know who the victim is or who, they all know who the uh, wrongdoer is and they know the, the back story. Whereas you, put, you take them to outside the system, they, they, don't, they only see the wrongdoing. They don't even pay attention to the victim, right? So they're not there to fix or to help. You know, so, so the beauty of um, Peacemaking Circle is that it's place-based. It should be. It should be right in the community and designed by the community members. We were requested to do a, a healing circle in a, in a tribal community where uh, there was a murder. Uh, a young man killed his father. And uh, we did, and we had 60-some community people in the circle. It lasted roughly nine hours. But the community got to express their grief, their frustrations, their pain. But the, the beautiful part of the circle was is that the, the young man that killed his father was allowed to call a cell phone in the circle, his aunt's cell phone, from the jail. And put on speakerphone, he became part of the circle. And it was, it was so enlightening to know that they didn't condone the fact that he killed his father. But they all had positive things to say about this young man. Uh, he worked with kids. He, he was teaching them weaving and different cultural things. And now this community suffers the loss of a, what they thought would be a future leader because he's probably going to be incarcerated for some time. They lost a tribal member who died. And they were very concerned about this. And at one point, this young man said, is my grandpa there? And they said, yes, grandpa's here. And he said, I love you, grandpa. And grandpa said, I love you too. They'd never spoken those words in their life. 
And what the community was talking about, the, the, he'd done a terrible thing, but he was still a good human being. That young man's re-entry program started that day, and he hadn't even been to court yet. We are overly represented in so many of the demographics that tear at our heartstrings. And I think if more people had a chance to really connect with their culture, of which peacemaking, wowa wala wichoni, is a part of that, um, that we would deter and like put so many people on a completely different trajectory. And right now, the place where peacemaking can happen is through tribal courts. When I started, this was one of my primary responsibilities that NARF uh, wanted me to pick up and run with, and that's the first time they've devoted serious staff attorney time to advance in the Indigenous Peacemaking Initiative, or IPI. Um, what we've done with that is just try to build it out so that it's there to serve tribal interests. Um, we focus the uh, priorities of the project based on some surveys that we've done of tribal justice system employees and, and other workers over the years. And what those priorities are, are first to provide just basically an information bank for tribes where tribes can share information about how they've implemented traditional dispute resolution systems or recovered their previous systems or whatever with other tribes who might be interested in seeing how they did it. Um, second off, we also provide training if, if we're qualified. So we have an advisory committee that consists of about a dozen of the leaders in the field of peacemaking who've been doing the work for 30 years or you know, in some cases, a long time like that. And those people are sometimes available to go out and train other tribal members in, in how to do stuff, uh, how to do effective peacemaking, and also how to implement peacemaking within an existing system or existing government or judicial structure. And then finally, we provide advocacy when, when appropriate. So we help to promote peacemaking as a, as a viable option within tribal communities, and then also try to promote the legitimacy and, and encourage people within the state and federal systems to take tribal dispute resolution systems or traditional cultural dispute resolution systems as, as something worthy of a lot of consideration, a lot of deference. The decisions that come out are, are good and solid. I went through the training, I became a facilitator, and we held a circle in Northway. And what I noticed about it is that they, they were ready to embrace anything different. They said, exactly, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to um, address, first of all, petty offenses. And I wanted to bring people out together to come up with a resolution that everyone could live with or to make uh, amends to their community. And, and I asked for their support. And they said, oh, sure, we'll support that. And that's how I got started. And what I noticed is everybody was enthusiastic. They showed up before, you know, usually people are late. They were early. They, they, we had our preacher come. You know, it's like we, we define what, what, what works in our community. And that, to, to me, is the beauty of, circ of, of Peacemaking Circle, is we define what works for us. When I decided early on that I needed to explore more culturally appropriate uh, options for resolving conflicts and disputes in our own tribal community, I was told that I could never do that because in Michigan, tribal people had been so assimilated that we would never know what the traditional law was. Well, even if that's true, we know what the traditional process was. And the process was bringing people together on the circle and trusting the circle to provide the answers as people talk things through. One day, an elderly man came, and my idea of being a judge is like the way how another non-Indian would run the proceeding. So this elderly man stood up and ra raised his hand, wanted to say something. So uh, I told him, you better sit down. And he kept raising his hand. I said, if you don't, I'm going to you know, cite you with contempt you know, for interfering with the judicial proceeding. So he sat down, but I, I never forgot that experience. And, 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 and you know, there was uh, many times I thought about, you know, what if, I, what if I had allowed him to speak 
what would he have said? I mean, here's an elderly man who, who look, looked like he knew quite a bit about what was going on. And, and I thought, but if I allowed him to speak, imagine he would have gave some really good piece, pieces of his, of his wisdom, direction. And so this is what I think about the problem, and these are the options we should think about. I mean, a Navajo, an elderly man, a man or a woman can say that, even to this day. Thank you, Brittany. And um, yeah, so that's a, a good introduction to the work that we do. It's really about the tribal nations in the United States recovering ways that they resolve disputes for hundreds and thousands of years um, prior to the, the provision of a tribal adversarial court by the United States, generally in about the 1940s or so. Um, those courts haven't worked out so well in the tribal nations. Partially, in large part, I guess, because they were um, underfunded, they are underfunded, but also because it just doesn't fit, as, as I'll explain a little bit. And this is just an introductory talk. I don't really have a whole lot of time. I'm going to go fast um, through some slides, but it'll be an introduction. And, and you can find our web page. You can reach out to me and we can talk more. And we want to share information with people all over the Americas. Especially, I mean, it's really exciting to think that there's people all over on the, on the call here. I'm going to share my screen and share this slideshow with you. I'll, like I said, I'll go really fast. Um, yeah, this is the Indigenous Peacemaking Initiative is, is what we call the project. It's part of the Native American Rights Fund, which is, like I described, a nonprofit law firm in the United States that's been in existence since 1970. It chooses its cases by these five priorities that were set in 1970. And this work comes under the fifth one, developing Indian law and educating the public about Indian rights laws and issues. This is a development of Indian law because it's basically a recovery of tribal traditions and helping them to put it into modern legal systems, however they would like to do that within their own jurisdictions. Here is a, is a summary listing of the priorities of the project, as well as a couple of websites. One, the bottom one is for the video that you just saw. And the top website there, peacemaking.narf.org, is the, is the place where we share everything. So you feel free to go look at that and to be in touch. There's a nice definition. Um, peacemaking focuses on healing and restoring relationships between the parties in disagreement and others. So it's a focus on relationships and healing rather than on applying facts to law and determining whether somebody's guilty or not or determining what somebody has to do. It's more about talking things through. Um, <clears throat> the real difference here, I think, is a, is a difference in worldview. Um, in, the, in, the, in the Western Hemisphere, as the different uh, indigenous nations were colonized, they were generally um, made to adapt to a Euro-Anglo-American model of, of justice that's based on rights. And if you follow the history of rights, rights are granted by sovereigns and they're held against others. And so what we do with the legal system is we try to uphold our rights. And if somebody infringes our right, we go seek, uh, we seek relief from somebody in authority, from somebody higher up. That's a very hierarchical uh, system. Um, and in order to, to resolve the disputes, we basically fight it out in order to be the winner. And we rely on experts who can help us fight and who can decide the winner. So the judges are the ones, the experts who decide the winner. And uh, we can hire experts, in, that's attorneys, and uh, to help us fight. And the more money we have, the more resources we have, the stronger a fighter we might be able to purchase the services of. So it's um, overall, this is a highly economic system and it's highly hierarchical. And on the other hand, on the other side of the, of the slide here, on the right-hand side, is uh, a more indigenous worldview that I want to counterpose to the, to the Anglo-Euro-American uh, system. Instead of rights in an indigenous worldview, typically we'll have relationships are key. Uh, relationships between people and between people and other, and other living beings and other things in the world. Respect is key, responsibility is key, and reciprocity. 
So I'd like to point out that these four R's are what's important to an indigenous worldview rather than rights. And I can actually talk for like a half an hour about the difference and about how rights get framed in indigenous worldviews. But what's at its core is these four R's instead of the notion of rights. Um, in indigenous uh, dispute resolution, we typically address the problem as a group. And the only expert involved is a person who, who helps facilitate the conversation and problem solving. So it's somebody who's expert at helping people talk things through and come to some sort of a solution that they can live with moving forward. The system is highly nurturing and it's highly egalitarian. So compared to economic and hierarchical, you, you can imagine there would be situations where it's much more preferred. And especially if you're if you're from if you operate in a worldview that's more like that on the right than it is on than the worldview that's on the left of this slide why does it work i think that um, peacemaking resolutions tend to create senses of belonging for individuals in community they tend to support and help um, and help fortify self-esteem and dignity the the processes involved in the peacemaking systems and approaches um, result in better handling of emotions overall, both in the short term and the long term in an individual's lives. Um, people get support from their groups and from family. The outcomes are mutually derived and consented. People focus on the problem and on healing rather than on labeling the person in any certain way, such as bad. And then generally, we, what we do in these systems is they reflect who we are and or who we aspire to be rather than some foreign system. Um, in terms of the sustainable development goals, I think it's interesting. I think these two goals, 16 and 17, are the most appropriate in this discussion. Um, I think we promote peaceful and inclusive societies and so on by allowing these sorts of dispute resolution systems to develop and by supporting their development as well. And then also strengthen the means of implementation and revitalize the global partnership for sustainable development. Um, if we have ways to resolve disputes that result in people moving together, moving forward together in a consensual manner, rather than having to fight it out and, and have a neutral third party decide what the outcome should be, we, we're more um, able to move forward together on an ongoing basis. That's more sustainable. When people go to court and fight it out in, in front of the neutral third party, both parties walk away unhappy. Both parties have been beaten up if the system's working the way it's supposed to work. And you gotta wonder whether a system that works that way is really something that's gonna lead to sustainable development and implementation. There, there's definitely um, situations where it's preferable to have a different system. Um, and then I, I also, I think, given that we're in the international and United Nations context, it's really important to point out that the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is, uh, ha is replete with support for indigenous peacemaking systems and development and, and application of traditional to the indigenous populations systems of dispute resolution. Um, Okay, just real briefly, when we do trainings, when we talk about this in more detail, we point out that these things occur in circles usually, and that we talk about talking pieces, which govern who's going to speak and when people can speak. Um, we rely on values that are common to the people on the circle. We describe a process that helps people get to a resolution in the end. And then we describe guidelines which govern behavior and communication so that it helps people to, to reach a resolution. Um, where is peacemaking happening? This is in the United States. This is a list of tribal nations and some other courts where we know that peacemaking is happening because we either have their laws on the books and on our webpage that you can see, or we actually just know of it. We, we know the people doing the work. And so this is a long list, but this isn't all because here's a page two. So I think there's about 54 on this list out of the tribal nations within the United States that are doing peacemaking. So that's pretty exciting. With that, I say Wopila, that's Lakota for thank you. It doesn't mean thank you. It means there's been a state of honoring. And I always like to say that as my thank you because you've honored me by inviting me here and by listening to me and by giving me your attention. So I appreciate it very much and, and look forward to meeting some of you uh, in, given that this is a door opening and an introduction. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brett. That was wonderful. Yeah, Brett, you're gonna make a lot of friends here.
<laughs> you could. I mean, you don't. You don't have strangers. You just have friends you haven't met yet. And you're just, exactly. You're 100 exactly. Years, you have hundred new friends, buddy. <laughs> Thank you. I sure Thanks, appreciate Brett. it. Thank you all. We're going to transition now uh, to Philip with UN University. Thank you so much, Brittany, and. Um, Great thank you to both of our keynote speakers, as well as to everyone at RCE Salisbury. We are so uh, pleased and also really grateful for you for not only hosting this year, but last year, you have carried over hosting duties for two years now, um, which during this unprecedented disruption in global meetings, we really appreciate because you've handled it with such poise and dignity. So thank you. Um, hello to everyone. I wish we could all be face to face again. Sadly, that is still not the case. Um, so I am going to be doing a little bit of my usual spiel. And I'd like to ask you to bear with me because I know um, a lot of you are familiar with the RCE movement and what we do, but I always have to balance that with an audience that might be a little less familiar. So I'm going to provide a recap of what we're doing within the ESD in or Education for Sustainable Development in the UN system, and a little bit about where our network fits in there, as well as some updates. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. And apologies if I'm looking off to the side. Um, I try to watch my um, clock. Uh, lecturers are notorious for going over time, so I'm really trying to challenge that and make sure that I'm speaking to time. So that makes sure that everyone gets an opportunity to speak. So um, hello and welcome. Uh, we are at the 10th America's Regional RCE meeting. So very briefly, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the UN platforms related to education for sustainable development. Uh, how our network, the regional centers of expertise have developed, uh, where we're at in activities that we've done for the last couple of years, and a little bit about ways forward. So, um, as many of you know, education has really been a central key component to sustainable development for as long as human societies have worked, uh, but officially in the UN system, we started centering it more in the 1990s. Many of you remember Rio uh, Agenda 21 and the launch of the Millennium Development Goals. We've now transitioned to a much more holistic and uh, worldwide focus for sustainable development that's a little less colonial and a little more looking at sustainable development across all nations, not just trying to develop economies, but to make sure that societies operate justly and sustainably within the Earth's ecosystems. So with that, we have the launch of the Global Action Program on ESD, the launch of the Sustainable Development Goals, and of course now, uh, this past June, uh, or the past spring, the launch of ESD for 2030, which is the next phase. So we're still very much in the mix with the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and a lot of the education that we worked with in the first five years of the Sustainable Development Goals is going to continue. So for those of you not familiar, uh, we do have five priority areas within the UN that we're working with, with education for sustainable development. Uh, those are advancing policy, transforming the environments where learning and training happens, uh, building capacities of educators and other trainers, empowering and mobilizing youth, and then right where we are in the global network of RCEs, accelerating sustainable solutions at the local level. And that um, has been my privilege to work with for the last few years. Um, so RCEs are unique in that we're not national governments usually. We are local, uh, sometimes city governments that work closely with other community partners. Uh, sometimes uh, subnational governments, and sometimes just conglomerations of stakeholders within regions that transcend uh, any political boundary. Um, so we just left the Global Action Program and a few brief points on that. So there was a lot of enthusiasm for it. All goal setting in the UN is international, but uh, as we quickly learn, all implementation is local. And the neat thing about both ESD and the Sustainable Development Goals is there's a lot of enthusiasm for it with stakeholders on the ground. Um, that being said, um, even though local communities did a lot of the engagement, 
youth engagement around the world still remains relatively low. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. Youth are working more hours uh, than any previous generation. And um, we still have a lot of the burden for implementing ESD falling squarely on the shoulders of teachers in formal schooling systems. But we're really trying to push ESD beyond that. So how do adults learn? How do seniors learn? How do seniors share their knowledge? And uh, what are we looking at when we're talking about lifelong learning? So in the new phase we're entering, the goals for ESD for 2030 is to continue strengthening ESD. So using that education as an implementing mechanism for all 17 of the sustainable development goals and doing that not only through knowledge transfer, but through actual learning to change, learning to make our societies more just and more sustainable, not just thinking about it, but implementing it. Um, so building education systems that support learners of all ages, um, hoping to go beyond lip service to that, to actually look at what does it mean for lifelong learning and not putting the entire burden on youth and young people. Um, and making all people in society active contributors for a more peaceful, a more sustainable planet. So these are the big goals within the UN as a whole. The objectives within ESD for 2030 is to raise awareness of not only all of the SDGs, but how education has a role in implementing all of them. What learning, what training, what wisdom needs to happen in order for people to transform and for societies to transform. Um, so we just went through the call for action for commitments, um, and we do have a big uh, focus on stakeholder commitments, um, including multi-stakeholder uh, commitments. So RCEs are very familiar with that at the local level. Um, the UN is encouraging all member states to actually upscale that at the country level to make sure that we actually have um, whole communities not only working within their region, but hopefully upscaling when appropriate to work as nations to reinforce partnerships. So we want to see an increase in awareness of ESD globally. And we also want to see an understanding of the importance of education in implementing sustainable development. Um, hopefully we're seeing that a lot in our communities and that trickles up not only to society as a whole, but to national governments as well. And we want participants to increase their efforts towards enacting ESD in professional capacities. So hopefully going beyond uh, ESD in schools, looking at ESD in society as a whole. Fortunately, for those of you familiar, um, the structure of ESD for 2030, as was unveiled in Berlin earlier this year, is going to look very similar to the GAP. Um, the five partner networks are hopefully going to be communicating better with one another, so we don't operate in silos. That's one thing we're always preaching against in ESD. Um, UNESCO also is making a bigger push for national government partners to really try to get uh, member states to link their sustainable development policies to their education for sustainable development policies and looks to how those are can be linked together more effectively. Um, there is a bigger emphasis on development partners. So how can we communicate across borders and collaborate across borders for both ESD and sustainable development? Um, as well as to play up the role of donors within the private sector. So a lot of you might be familiar with the Green Climate Fund. Um, the UN is really trying to capitalize on not only INGOs and governments, but also private sector in facilitating sustainable development. So where we come in as a network, <clears throat> and I'm sure a lot of you have seen this slide many times, but for those of you that haven't, um, an RCE is itself a network of existing formal and non-formal, as well as informal organizations that work together to create that integrated network for sustainable development education at the local level. And the neat thing about RCEs is that you are able to pick the sustainable development issues that you want to work on. Um, it's totally bottom up. Uh, you are the experts on your own communities and you get to pick the topics that are most relevant for you. In terms of what uh, modalities that we work in, 
uh, here at the Global RCE Service Center. Um, we do global meetings every other year where we try to bring everyone together. We're meeting virtually uh, with RCE Scotland hosting this coming November. If you haven't registered yet, please do. Uh, there are three days with different programming times, so hopefully one of those is kinder to your schedule than others. Uh, we know the Americas uh, struggles because uh, so many of our network are in Asia Pacific, Africa and Europe. Um, so thank you very much for those of you who have stayed up late at night to join us. And for those of you that can't, we completely understand. Uh, please know that uh, the rest of the UN system tends to operate by New York time. So the rest of the world is just as tired of getting up late. Um, we also do regional RCE meetings yearly, like this one. Some communities do national RCE meetings. This has been more common in Asia and Europe. Um, thematic meetings, which tend to be structured around UN events, like, for example, the Climate or the Biodiversity COP. And we have a very active youth network doing youth meetings. So I'm not going to go into too much detail on this because you'll see my slides later. Um, but we have still had a busy year despite our online modality. Um, the global webinar, um, we decided to break it up into three. So we had a February meeting, a June meeting, and we will be having a concluding December webinar. And we've also had a lot of publications come out this year. So some of you um, have contributed works to being projects showcased for ESD. First in our climate publication, and we have a biodiversity one coming out hopefully before the end of this year. Um, but for the remainder of the year, um, please know that we do have the RCE award challenge still going. This is a chance for you to nominate a project your RCE has worked on uh, for acknowledgement within the system, and we try to showcase those in some multimedia presentations. Um, also the same week, the Asia Pacific meeting is happening. So apologies for those of you who had to split your time between the two. And for the remainder of the year, um, as I said, please keep an eye out to the global seminar that'll happen in December or in November, apologies, in conjunction with the COP in Glasgow for the climate. Um, and we will still be having our Ubuntu committee meeting in December to welcome new RCs into the fold. And I don't want to go too much over time because I think we have two of our new RCEs that are going to be introducing themselves next. Um, so very briefly, I won't go too much into the details. We have launched a new roadmap. Um, if you have any questions, please check that out. We've had a couple of webinars on it. And basically, this is just our path forward on how to uh, strengthen and support the network going forward into ESD for 2030. So um, I don't think I have too much time for Q&A, uh, but I'll be sticking around throughout the presentation today and a little bit after uh, during the informal gathering. So you'll have a little more time to talk with me. Um, but this year's program has really been a labor of love from the RCEs themselves. And you have a lot of really committed members from around the continental region that have put in a lot of really fantastic planning into how the region can work together and what projects you can do jointly in addition to individually as RCEs. So I think I will call it time on my presentation and give our new uh, RCEs from Peel and Phoenix a chance to introduce themselves. So thank you so much for your attention. Um, I will be here, though I will probably turn my camera off to make sure I have a stable connection. So thank you so much, Brittany and Brian. And I look forward to all of you uh, over the course of the coming three days. Thanks, Philip. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Now we're going to be having two presentations from our two brand new RCEs. Molly, are you there? I sure Molly. am. Yay! Hi, Molly. Okay, Molly, hey. representing representing. Wow, I can't talk. <laughs> Greater Phoenix, RCE Greater Phoenix. Molly, what would help you? Would you like to share your screen, or I can, if whatever. Uh, yeah, either way, I have mine pulled up, so I can go ahead and share. Yeah, you do it, it. Yeah, that way you can see. Make it easy for both of us. Okay. So um, I wanted to go ahead and start. Uh, yep. Uh, we are the RCE Greater Phoenix, um, I, and we have a, uh, a horizontal leadership structure, and so 
the team that is leading the RCE Greater Phoenix right now is uh, myself and also Dr. Janet Goebel, who is also on the line here, and Dr. Carlos Casanova, who's from a different college uh, here at Arizona State University. Um, and so Arizona State University is the, um, we were the applying backbone organization for this RCE. So I wanted to start off with a land acknowledgement. This is based around ASU, um, but all ASU campuses in Phoenix occur in the greater Phoenix area. Uh, and uh, I wanted to acknowledge that uh, there are 22 tribal nations in Arizona, including the Akamel and Ootam and Peeposh nations. Uh, the original inhabitants of these lands still reside throughout the Phoenix metropolitan area. And we recognize the impact of their wisdom and generosity towards us. Uh, an interesting note is that when you fly into the valley, you can see the Salt River Project canals. Um, and that brings us water uh, from the surrounding area and from the Colorado River. And those these canals are actually uh, part of the framework of canals originally constructed by the ancestral Sonoran Desert people, the Hohokam. So to make this area both livable and a place where people can thrive uh, as we continue to do so today. So we acknowledge that the modern day indigenous nations that descended from the ancestral peoples are the original inhabitants of this land. Uh, just a quick overview of the RCE. Here's our vision. We uh, aim to support all community members while prioritizing historically marginalized youth through meaningful, equitable and participatory learning experiences to contribute to sustainability in the region. Um, and this photo here, so this is what part of Dr. Uh, Casanova's doctoral research where he did youth participatory action research. Um, his field of study is actually uh, primarily focused on justice education. Uh, so he brings that, that aspect into a lot of our work. And then here's our mission. Uh, we partner on new and existing projects to foster cross-sectoral collaborations. Um, we also support access to equitable and quality sustainable uh, sustainability education um, and also empower sustainability education professionals. So while like, for example, I am with the Sustainability Teachers Academy at ASU, so I have a primary focus on K through 12 formal education. Part of our uh, network in the greater Phoenix area is also for informal education and for professional education. Um, so we have other folks at ASU that are working with corporations like Wells Fargo. Um, and we also hope to empower sustainability. Oh yeah, I just said that. <laughs> we also hope to develop research projects to advance the practice of sustainability education overall. Um, and so I wanted to highlight some of the partners. So these committed organizations on the top here, if you can read those, those were a really huge factor in our original application and are still very closely partnered with us moving forward in the RCE Greater Phoenix. Um, this includes both the cities of Phoenix and Tempe. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the Phoenix area, Phoenix Metro includes like several metropolitan, like several city areas. So we have two of those cities that have signed on with the RCE. We also have several public schools, including a public school district. Um, we have several community colleges, including the major community college district for the area, um, and that's Maricopa Community College District, and they actually have their own sustainability office, which is incredible. And finally, we have a couple of nonprofits. There's Local First Arizona, which represents local businesses, and the Arizona Sustainability Alliance, and they have several projects um, in I think the for-profit sphere, they're a nonprofit, but they also do a lot with education. Um, so they partner with other K through 12 schools and informal education uh, organizations. And then uh, these last two kind of bullet points here about supportive organizations. When we first decided to apply, uh, we called together lots of folks from the local community. And these are some of the folks that came and showed up and uh, wanted to give us support, but didn't officially sign on with the letter, but are interested in maintaining um, in uh, maintaining contact and, and knowing a little bit more about us. So finally, I wanted to highlight some of the projects that we have underway. Um, we established a community of practice for furthering the research on ESD. We actually met earlier today, which was exciting. Um, we're also working on mapping and showcasing existing sustainability education opportunities at ASU and in the Valley. Uh, we're developing a funding strategy for our priority action areas. And Carlos is again working with youth participatory action research and youth with the city of Tempe. Um, also, the Sustainability Teachers Academy is leading some professional development with some Greater Phoenix teachers. And finally, my colleague Rob with the Teachers Academy 
He is working on establishing a sustainability education hub at a local Tempe High School, which is Jordan Del Sol. So thanks. I'm so pleased to be here. This is very exciting. Thanks, Mo thanks so much, Molly. We're so lucky to have you. Sabir, are you there? Uh, yes. Yes. Would you like to share your screen? Yes, I would, I would share my screen. Wonderful. Now we have a presentation from RC Peel. They're in Canada. They're also another new RCE. Can you see my screen or is just? Yeah. Uh... You can see it perfect. Okay. Um, can you see my second slide? Yes. Okay, so thank you. Uh, so I'm Sabir Said. I will be um, um, presenting on Peel RCE. And thank you, Brittany and Brian, for inviting us. And Philip, uh, thank you for approving our application. So I'll quickly present uh, our vision, mission, and goals, uh, as well as the collaboration partners and communication strategy and the work plan. So region of Peel um, is a part of a greater Toronto area. And we are very pleased to uh, be with the uh, new four RCEs uh, that have been approved. So it's great to see the presentation from Phoenix as well. And I'm glad to be a part of uh, 179 RCEs. So region of Peel is the second largest municipality in um, Ontario and fifth largest in Canada. So we are a part of a greater Toronto area and we have 1.4 million residents. And we have got three cities, cities of Mississauga, Brampton, and town of Caledon. So we have a good mix of urban and rural areas. And we provide um, regional services such as health, housing, transportation, water, wastewater, police, and other municipal services. Uh, our goal uh, is to be a collaborative entity and create a healthy and sustainable community for life. And this is our mission where we want to support uh, the sustainable movement of people and goods as well as climate change resiliency and the economic prosperity as well as the high quality of life. So we are supporting uh, several goals of SDGs, uh, especially focusing on healthy lives, uh, sustainable development, building in um, resilient infrastructure, because we are in the business of building infrastructures and also helping uh, cities to be safe, um, um, resilient and sustainable, as well as um, uh, combating climate change. So we have really good support from several uh, uh, stakeholders. And as Philip mentioned that we have all four levels of uh, government represented, so including the federal, uh, provincial, so the state level government, as well as the local municipalities. And we have an excellent support uh, from uh, various stakeholders, both public sector as well as private sector. And we have got four universities in our region. So we are all four universities, uh, school boards. There are two school boards. They are all part of our RCE. So this is the draft, I'm just saying the draft governance structure because there has been so much interest that everybody wants to be on the project and steering committee. So we are still working with many of our stakeholders to make sure that they are on our steering committee. Uh, and we really want to make sure that we provide a meaningful, um, a, 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 a min, min, meaningful role for everyone. <laughs> Uh, we will be developing our communication strategy, and this is just our regional appeal just 100 years ago. So now we are looking forward to, um, and we are already going to space, so you can see the transportation would be very different in next 100 years. And one of the key uh, thing about our communication strategy would be that we'll be focusing on all um, media uh, tools and resources, including social media. Uh, these are the, uh, we are currently developing the work plan, so we are focusing on the sustainable transportation, goods movement, environment, economics, education, as well as uh, focusing on equity and social justice, as well as innovation. So there are broader action items that we are planning to undertake as a part of uh, the RCE work plan. So the next step, uh, we are working with the stakeholders, we are finalizing, uh, finalizing our short, medium, and long-term plan, and also implementing uh, the work plan. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to be a part of RCEs. And as you can see, uh, uh, as Molly mentioned, uh, our Greater Toronto Area, we are just a part of a Greater Toronto Area. So we want to make that big difference to our community and to the broader community as a whole. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sabir. 
welcome. And we're also, uh, this is a message to everyone. We're also gonna be sharing all the presentations. I'm keeping everything in a Google Drive folder right now. And I'll be sharing it um, with the RC Service Center to get it on their website. So. Uh, we're actually gonna be transitioning to our next moderator. Um, Ray, are you there? Yes, hi. Um, it's nice to see everybody here. This has been so amazing so far. Um, our next presenter is going to be Diego Adamson. Um, he's going to be doing the steering committee review of governance. And um, he's the director of RCE um, Cuanca del Plata. So Diego, are you ready? Yes. Hi, everyone. Okay, wonderful. Uh, hi, hi. Well, it's a, it's a really it's a real pleasure to be here um, with you all. Um, these meetings remind us why we're here. I think it's uh, really inspirational. Um, so, uh, Britt, how do I do? I just uh, share. Yeah, you should just be able to click the green button, share screen. Uh, okay. Let me yeah. see. Yep, we see it. Brilliant. So perhaps I can uh, do this, perhaps. Let me know when you're... Yep, it's up. It's okay, we're on. So thank you. Um, so basically, um, my turn now is to share with you all what we've been doing uh, for uh, almost a year actually, uh, after uh, the last um, annual meeting, we, we came together and we basically decided to um, give it a push to, to a governance structure and perhaps um, discover how to uh, move forward together in a more, um, you know, converging, uh, with, with synergy and, and vision uh, sharing um, our, our resources, our, our commitments, et cetera. So um, just a brief note, uh, what you're seeing now uh, at the bottom of the slide is the new logo we will be introducing formally tomorrow um, through the presentation of our um, communication support committee. But this is just a, a a bit of a sample. Mm -hmm. So um, again, uh, just a brief, brief uh, recap, uh, the mission or purpose that was um, uh, defined last year uh, is the RC Americas Network Steering Committee facilitates collaboration and exchange among RC members, empowers them locally and helps them become a leading network in the region for transformative action through ESD to achieve the SDGs throughout the Americas. Um, and the vision is to achieve in the SDGs in the Americas by 2030 and creating an ongoing Americas learning space for sustainable development. Um, the steering committee is um, the, the, um, the structure we put together to, to actually put this uh, into motion. Um, the governance principles we've designed and, and defined was uh, basically based on autonomy and accountability to regional stakeholders, to capacity um, to advance local priorities, academic freedom as a core value, collaborative resources derived from individual RCEs and partners uh, and managed locally, freedom to decide to participate in collaborative projects, representation of RCEs on behalf of RCEs agreeing to be present, uh, represented or at, um, informed by commitments to the UN University on ESD uh, and the America's Network serves the RCEs mm, uh, service leadership. Mm. The authority derives from the UNU acknowledgement mm, for self-sustaining and uh, um, resources from our own regions and reporting and accountability beyond our own region is to the UN University program parameters and whatever they agree to. Mm -hmm. And um, also the collaboration and cooperation side of things, um, absolutely um, key to everything here. We've been already um, hearing about reciprocity, um, voluntary participation, resource sharing, multilingualism, 
equality, capacity building, community engagement, and shared leadership. And of course, inclusion and participation, respect for indigenous cultures and worldviews, and recognition of respect for celebration of and strengthening of broad multiculturalism of the Americas. Mm. This was the structure we, we devised um, last year, and we've been um, shaping it up accordingly um, over these uh, few months. So basically, we have a steering committee and three support committees, mm, one being the strategic planning, governance, and policy one, then cooperation, outreach, liaison, and R&D, and then the administrative, uh, technical, and communications. Mm. And then around it, uh, four task forces aim at um, basically a set of SDGs. Um, for you know, um, to basically organize uh, the the work and 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 the focus, uh, it's not restrictive. It's basically just to uh, have a have a lens through which um, organize the work. So basically, we have people, sustainable cities and prosperity, planet, and um, education and well-being, of course. So the steering committee. Mm -hmm. Um, this is more or less the, the structure and the approach, one person from each support committee, one person from each acknowledged task force. We have youth representation, multilingualism, equitable distribution of members throughout the Americas. This is an ongoing effort. Um, at large members like co-chairs, advisors, and UNU, and general advisors to the service center. Mm -hmm. Then, um, the, the responsibilities of the steering committee is to oversight of the RC Americas network, to implement the mission based on the purpose and principles, co-organization of the annual Americas meeting, representation, collaboration, and participation, coordination of data collection, oops, sorry, uh, data collection and reporting, um, accountability, budget oversight, um, and um, identifying network priorities. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically we will be working on the, the strategy policies, uh, best practices, reporting um, templates of all sorts and the evaluation of annual out outcomes. Um, the basic idea is to have uh, three uh, terms. Um, We'll have uh, meetings in a quarterly annual uh, fashion and the ability to collaborate with each task force and support committees in order to keep things rolling. The strategy governance and policy, basically, um, as you can imagine, has to do with developing uh, the, the overall strategy, um, the, defining a, a strategic roadmap, um, exchanging uh, strategic information, developing policies, monitor implementation, um, provide relevant information regarding governance, etc. And of course, advice to the steering committee. Mm -hmm. uh, will be um, the, the outputs will will be valuable uh, documents of all of all sorts. And of course, we will be meeting uh, on, a, on a regular basis to, to keep track of things. The cooperation um, outreach liaison and R&D mm, will have to do with basically that, uh, finding ways of, of pulling together and, and um, create synergy among um, different RCEs and to basically promote uh, um, actually, um, well, a, a collective output mm, uh, to be, uh, to become greater than our own individualities, basically. And the Comstech and admin, uh, of course, we will be working on, on terms of, of well, basically the, the visual identity, our, our communications channels, publications, 
the technology involved in, in, in digital communication between members, etc. All of this will be um, uh, presented to you tomorrow hmm, on the communications committee. And the task forces, as we mentioned, uh, we will have be having four. These are the SDGs uh, assigned to them um, based on, on, on the decision process we had last year. Um, I, we, we know uh, some, some of them have been uh, meeting um, uh, from the early 2000, uh, 2021 this year, uh, but there's still um, some, some work to do on, on, on that regard. We, we still need to, to find ways of, of you know, getting together and, and decide how to, how to work together in these lines. And basically, as you can imagine, the task forces um, will be developing content in terms of uh, education material or, or research or, or projects within the, the, the scope of the territorial scope of, of each RCE, but also finding ways of, again, delivering uh, a greater output uh, by combining our, our vision and um, resources and, and learning experience. And I think this is the, basically the, the crucial bit. One of the, the things we, we've been working on and uh, that we need to, to decide how to move forward is the overall strategy. What um, we've envisioned is a strategy based on, well, a, a purpose-driven in the sense that we are committed to the sustainable development goals. Of course, we, we have a lot to do with ESG for 2030, but also in order to walk the talk, we need to consider the possibility of aiming towards becoming a sustainable network. In terms of ESD for 2030, this is the, um, the blueprint uh, from UNESCO, the priority action areas Philip was, was mentioning, of course, and the strategic objectives and, and, and target groups. The idea is to align ourselves with the priority action areas and see where ways of, of contributing to, to each of them. This is also uh, how UNESCO works in terms of promoting education for sustainable development. And uh, we believe there are lots of ways the, the America's network can um, align itself to it and, and devise ways of, of advancing each area. And of course, keeping in mind that the um, SDG 4 and, and specifically target 4.7 is at the core of um, our understanding of the SDGs as a whole. Uh, there's, um, there's a structure, if you please, um, down at the bottom. We, we believe it's, it's kind of a, ways of interpreting the, the 2030 agenda. Mm -hmm. We as a network, of course, we, we, we start off um, through the SDG 17 mm -hmm. partnerships, through SDG 4, and then of course, the three main SDGs for, for the global network, mm -hmm. the RC global network, it's, uh, responsible production and consumption, climate action, and um, biodiversity. So through those, we can approach the, um, the whole of the 2030 agenda and the 17 goals. And in that regard, this is just a, a rough um, um, uh, matrix, if you, if, you know, if, if you please, it's basically ESD for 2030 at the top. We as a, um, as a continental network with our governance structure 
supporting each individual RCE in order to, for them to um, align themselves to the priority action areas, but also combining our, our visions and, and possibilities in order to, to, to scale the outcomes. And in order, as I said, to walk the talk, this is just an idea that we've been um, discussing, the possibility of uh, setting ourselves quantitative and qualitative goals for the rest of the decade, how to measure our contribution to the priority action areas, each and every one of them in, in within the range of each RCE, but also uh, up and down the Americas, and also qualitative ones regarding excellence in education, the cooperation, how to be innovative and transparent and inclusive, but also, and this is the, the perhaps the, the, the most challenging bit, the possibility of considering ourselves uh, as a network to aim for carbon neutrality by the end of the decade, also to become a zero waste network and a nature positive. So these are the challenges we face. Uh, today, I heard that uh, we're only 99 months away from 2030. So I think it's a, it's a really important um, time in history we're living and there's, um, there's a lot we can do to, to make the future um, better for, for us and the coming generations. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Diego. So everyone, it is uh, 7.13. We're actually running a little bit ahead of schedule, but I'm going to, as promised in the schedule, give everyone a five minute break right now. So it is uh, now already 7.13. We'll be returning back within five minutes. Feel free to stretch and move around and I'll be right here. So we'll be returning at 7.17. Hey, Brittany, check your messages. I know there's four in front of you. <laughs> yes, the answer is yes.
You almost ready, Ray? Yeah, we're starting back at uh, 17 or 18. Oh no, just momentarily. Hi. Okay. I'm just getting <laughs> started. I'm oh, sorry. Ray, as um, we're going into the next section, could you introduce it? And then as you're talking, I will make the breakout rooms. Yeah, absolutely. Do you want me to go ahead? Uh, sure. Yeah. How much, time, <laughs> how much time do you need, Brittany? You can do it now. Okay. Okay. All right, everybody, as everyone's trickling back in, um, we're going to be starting our next section for the night. Um, we're going to be doing two uh, different 20 minute panel se sessions. Um, and they're going to be happening at the same time. So Brittany is going to be making different breakout sections and you guys get to choose which ones you want to go into. So the first one is Planet with Christopher Nitsch and task force members. It's going to be going over sustainability goals 6, 13, 14, and 15. Um, the other is with Brittany Fouts. Uh, and task force members doing education and well-being. It's going to be on sustainability goals two, three, and four. Um, and so you're going to have the option between those different breakout rooms that you get to choose. I can go over it one more time. Um, Planet with Christopher Mitch and task force members is going to be going over a sustainability goals six, 13, 14, and 15. And then Brittany Fouts and task force members are going to be doing education and well-being and that's sustainability goals two, three, and four. Um, so you can flip between the rooms as well if you want to. Um, but the 20 minute panels, Brittany should be letting you uh, hop into a many minute now. On mute. Yes. So you all have the freedom to choose what um, breakout room that you want to go in. Uh, you can choose. I haven't opened them up yet. I'm about to open them. Um, we're going to stay in them, as Ray said, for 20 minutes and then regroup. And I will be sending out a reminder as we get closer towards the 20 minutes as well. Um, but feel free to join us. We have the Planet Task Force and Education Task Force members here today. I'm going to open it right now. I'm also going to stay here in the waiting room while everybody's moving. And if you have any troubles getting to your breakout room, feel free uh, to message me. Oh, Steve, I got your message. Yes, I can. Okay, I'll move you, Shannon. Myra wants to go to Planet, okay. Walter wants to go to planet. Sabir wants to do education. Okay. I'm moving the people that um, have sent me messages right now. Okay. 
Diego, I'll move you. Do you want to go to planet? Fill up planet. Anybody else have a preference on where you'd like to go? Feel free to send me a message. Okay. If you are doing the education one, just be warned, I'm not there yet. <laughs> I'll, I'll move you to planet. Anybody else? Now we're just down to a few. Hmm. I'll hang out in the waiting room in case anybody that would there. actually be really helpful i didn't think yeah. about that and i'm yeah, not really all... sure where brian is yeah i think he might be in one of the waiting rooms or one okay. of the breakout rooms i'm going to go and jump into the education one feel free to join us if nobody comes okay thank you you're the best thing
back, just waiting for the other room. So for those who are here, we don't have much left. We just have for today closing remarks and then an optional social if anybody wants to join after eight. And then we're gonna to start tomorrow right at six and we're going to be having our communications committee present and then it's going to be presentations from the RCEs. We have a pretty busy schedule. Our youth ambassador might be able to join us. Yay. He's at a birthday party tonight though. Oh. His yeah. birthday party. <laughs> sounds really nice. 14. Oh, as Dr. Boudreaux, as Dr. Boudreaux would say, little kids like the existence, you, you know, God exists when you <laughs> look in their eyes and they're wonder, you know what I mean? Oh, I don't know if he can hear us. He's, he's probably, he's probably still with his class. Ah, wait a minute. Okay. I'm going to. I'm closing all rooms. I was going to say um, to Severe and others that um, I found uh, Kim's Kim Smith's uh, mentoring handbook on my computer, but um, I'm not hooked up to it right now. But I can share it with you. Um, Thanks, Steve. I'm just trying to figure out how to do that without. Um, I guess I you know. I, why don't I send it to you, Kim? And then could you put it? I don't think Kim would mind if we add it to the Google Docs, perhaps. Yeah, no, Kim, Kim's gone right now, but you can send it to me and I can get it to her. Yeah. Okay. I'll see I'll CC her though, make sure that if she has concerns, she can always send it. I don't think she yeah. yeah. Oh, hey Walter. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing great. Good to see all of you. Good to see you. I, I, everybody. Go ahead, Walters. Just say something real quick. Just say anything. Hi, Brian. <laughs> Doesn't he got a great vo radio voice? <laughs> Hi, this is Walter. <laughs> and here you just some. You could have been like a uh, that that smooth jazz radio guy in the morning, <laughs> big big markets and whatnot. <laughs> That's my calling. Yeah, <laughs> among other things, right? <laughs> I got really excited because there's a winery by Brian and I. And it was some months ago I was there and they actually, they sell the Shel Shelburne uh, farm cheeses there. Oh, wonderful. I was like, I know that place. Wait a minute. Down here or up there? Yeah. Down wow. here. They sell, hmm. yeah, their cheese. Oh. Okay, it was right. expensive, but it was really good. <laughs> hey, Ray. Taste of place. Uh, yeah. uh, so we're coming to a little bit of a wrap up. So we're gonna let Brian do the closing remarks for today. Um, and from around eight to 8.45 after their remarks, we're gonna have the RCE virtual social. So that'll um, give people opportunity to ask questions um, if they didn't have the opportunity to earlier. Um, so I'll go ahead and hand it over to Brian to do our closing remarks for the day. You know what, um, this is one of those things you, you take part in, it's not, until later on that all the information begins to gel and make sense. But I, one thing I do want to leave everybody with is Brittany has done an amazing job of getting this together. She said, oh, I'm so organized, disorganized. And oh my God, no, no, uh, you, you, you're suffering from what's called the imposter syndrome. You're <laughs> so much better than you think. And it's true. Everybody who knows her knows I'm speaking the truth. It's easy to speak the truth. And I, I just want to point out how much I appreciate this. And Philip was saying RCE Salisbury. Well, the backbone of RCE Salisbury is Brittany. Where, where, where are you going? Stay, stay, don't, go, go, don't go run away on me. <laughs> um, but you. yeah, yeah, Steve. But um, the other thing is all of us, everyone contributes something. And I've, I've been looking over Brittany's shoulders and looking at your presentations. And there's just a lot of good, exciting stuff to share the next two nights. And so, you know, for those of you who are, uh, Philip, where are you, by the way? Are you, are you, what part of the world are you? I'm still in Europe, so still oh. looking for you and you, but stranded in Europe. 
So, okay, um, that's a good cue to say have a good evening. And we'll see you guys all at, at uh, six o'clock tomorrow night. Yes. And, um, if, for those of you hanging out for the social, enjoy it. I'm going to a birthday party and I need to run. Tell them I say happy birthday. Yeah, yeah. Our little youth ambassador turned 14 today. Yay! <laughs> but guys, uh, it's good to see everybody. And we'll like. Tomorrow and, oh, yeah, yes, yes. And um, Brittany, I'll catch up with you in the morning. Okay. It was good. Bye, Brian. Bye, guys. So I'm going to stay on now to foster um, any kind of questions that we have now at the conclusion of our meeting. Um, I can also have us in break.